On December 4, 2003, a local workman, Daniel Gemmon, employee of the Sensenig and Weaver Well Drilling Company in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, arrived to begin his shift. It was 5 a.m. He clocked into work, made some coffee, and then went outside to fuel the company's six trucks. While doing so, a small red light emanating from the woods nearby caught his attention. He pointed out the red light to a colleague who had just arrived, and the two walked over to investigate the source. As they drew closer, they noticed that the light was coming from the dashboard of a four-door silver Honda Accord. The engine was running, and the front wheels rested near the edge of a four-foot creek drop. Both employees noticed blood on the driver's door and front fender. A closer inspection through the car window revealed a pool of blood on the back seat and footwell cash estimated to be around $200 and cell phone equipment were also strewn about inside. The employees called the Pennsylvania State Police. Troopers Keith Knoll and James Fasnacht arrived at the scene. They also noticed a pool of blood in the back footwell directly behind the driver's seat. One report from the Washington Post states that this pooled blood found in the footwell had seeped through from the driver's seat. However, most reports say that the blood indicates that the source was in the back of the car, while someone else had to have been driving. Searching the immediate area around the car, they soon came across a deceased man, attired in a suit and overcoat, lying face down in a stream. The man was 38-year-old Jonathan Luna, an assistant United States attorney in Baltimore, Maryland. 36 stab wounds were found on his body, more than half of which were located on his neck. Other incisions were found on his hands and fingernail marks were present on his wrists. All the wounds inflicted were described as superficial, indicating, and I quote, hesitation cuts according to authorities. The most grievous wound was a punctured left carotid artery. Such an injury would have caused him to bleed out and die within a matter of minutes. A head injury was also present. This is thought to have been caused by a fall into the rocky creek bed below. It's worth noting that the knife which was used, a pen knife or pocket knife, depending on where you're from, was not found at the scene until two months later. Two and a half hours after being found, the local coroner, Barry Walp, declared him dead. The cause of death was determined to be from stab wounds and drowning. He ruled it a homicide. A pathologist, Dr. Gary Kirchner, examined the body further and noted that his hands had been, and I quote, shredded, his scrotum bruised, and his throat had been slashed. It's also been reported that a partial unidentified fingerprint was found in blood, as was an unknown blood source. This information, however, comes from an anonymous source and therefore must be taken with a heavy dose of scepticism. Dr. Kirchner would also say that a number of wounds were found on Luna's back in hard to reach places. The lacerations on his hands and arms were determined to be defensive, and those small cuts described as hesitant cuts were determined to be marks consistent with torture. Some background information on the man that was Jonathan Luna will give us an idea as to who he was. He was the son of an African-American mother and Filipino father, and grew up in one of the many Bronx projects. Those who knew him described him as odd in an endearing way. During his school days, he was often seen sporting a well-cut suit when no such apparel was required. He was described as bookish, diligent and ambitious. He studied history at Fordham University and graduated in 1987 at the age of 22. Afterwards, he enrolled in the University of North Carolina Law School. All those who have subsequently commented on his general character have described him as charismatic, gentle, selfless and engaging. 
When his studies had finished, he got a position as a federal clerk in the office of US District Judge William L. Austin in Greenburg, North Carolina. While working in this position, he met his future wife Angela, and the two would later set up home in Elkridge, Baltimore. While in Baltimore, he acquired his position as an assistant United States attorney. On the morning of the 3rd of December, Luna left his house after saying goodbye to his wife and two sons. He drove to the federal office in Baltimore to begin work on a trial that had taken up most of his time in the days and weeks before. Luna was responsible for the prosecution of two men charged with running a heroin ring out of a music record label called Stash House Records. After a long day both in court and at his office, he called Archangelo Tuminelli, a defence counsel for the accused, at approximately 9pm and said that he was about to leave for home but would fax through the plea agreement. This was never received. The office car park clocking out system registers him leaving the location at 11.38pm. He left both his glasses, which he needed when driving, and his cell phone. It has been suggested that this indicates he left in a rush or had planned to return to his office. The next few pieces of information come from toll plazas and service stations. He is clocked at Fort McHenry Tunnel Toll Plaza heading northbound on Interstate 95 at 11.49pm. At 12.28am, his car passes through Perryville Toll Plaza heading northbound. At 12.46am, he is clocked going through Delaware Line Toll Plaza. At 12.57am, his debit card is used at an Exxon service station. $200 is withdrawn. Luna's car passes through two further turnpikes at 2.37 a.m. and 2.47. At 3.20 a.m. he uses his card to buy gas for two at a Sunoco station. It's also been said that he may have made another ATM withdrawal. At 3.30 a.m. a Roy Rogers restaurant staff member says she saw Luna. However, the FBI doubt this because of the distance between the location and Jonathan's last location. At 4.04 a.m. he handed over a bloody ticket. This was the Pennsylvania Turnpike at exit 286. For some reason, he didn't use his easy pass. After 4.05 a.m., we know he was alive when he pulled into the car park beside the creek. As we know, his body was discovered at 5.30 a.m. He was due in court at 9.30 a.m. Sometime after 9.30, his credit card was used at a King of Prussia shopping mall four hours after his body was discovered. He was found 95 miles away from his office in Baltimore and professionals ruled his death a homicide. However, there are some, including the FBI, that doubt this conclusion and believe that Jonathan Luna killed himself using a very unusual method. These people believe that Jonathan had a motive. The motive being his link to the disappearance of $36,000. The money was part of an evidence cache obtained during a search of an apartment linked to a bank robber named Nico Brown. During his trial, the money was brought into the courtroom. I can only presume for effect. Either way, Brown was found guilty on the 26th of September 2002. Subsequent to the money's appearance, the 36,000 went missing. Authorities launched an investigation going so far as to use polygraphs. Nothing came of these investigations, but one person who came under suspicion was Jonathan Luna. Some people believed he had taken the money to pay off credit card debts estimated to have been $25,000. It's also known as wife had no knowledge of some of these credit cards. A former FBI agent by the name of April Brooks has said that he was scheduled to take a polygraph, though this has never been confirmed. Those that know him, including Luna's supervisor, Joseph Evans, have said they find it hard to believe he stole anything. Evans stated, and I quote, The money was unattended at times, leaving so many opportunities for so many people to snag it. The incident apparently led to a further souring of Luna's relationship with his superior, US attorney, D. Biagio. Many that knew Jonathan say that this less than pleasant relationship affected his work and he stated only a week before his demise 
that he wished to leave the prosecutor's office to set up a private law firm. Some believe that the pressure got to him. Regardless of any motive for suicide, we have to contend with the fact that a pathologist has ruled the cause of death to be homicide. The conclusion was based on the physical evidence present. One of his fingernails was wounded in a manner associated with someone attempting to defend themselves. It's also been suggested that some of the wounds were located in areas that are difficult to explain if we are assuming they are self-inflicted. We must also contend with the fact that federal investigators are not convinced by the verdict. As we already know, they claim he intentionally killed himself using a prolonged and painful method or he was inflicting wounds on himself to, and I quote, gain sympathy from colleagues and his boss, D. Biagio. Mark Safarik, a former member of the FBI, told the Washington Post that he believes the verdict that he was murdered is weak. He stated that if you want to kill him, you would, and I quote, have used a weapon that would have taken care of business quickly. A Swiss Army style knife found at the scene killed Luna. A pen knife or Swiss Army knife is not the type of weapon you'd use in a homicide, unquote. Additionally, the pen knife was Luna's, so the killer didn't even bring that with him. Though this is a very fair point, there are also contradictions coming from the FBI over the years. Three months after Luna was found, an FBI news release offered a timeline for his murder. They also said investigators had, and I quote, obtained evidence which indicates Luna may have had contact with someone between the time he departed the United States Attorney's Office and the time his body was located. The mentioned evidence has never been released to the public. April Brooks, the former FBI agent based in Baltimore, refutes his statement and says, we're certain that there was no evidence to show that he was with anybody after he left the courthouse. So from the account we have, there seems to be no witnesses who saw Luna with anyone else that night. However, it has been circulated that he bought two tanks of gas at the Sunoco gas station, which is pretty odd. Authorities sought visual footage of Luna at this service station, but they didn't find any. However, they did indicate that they wished to speak to another man who was seen on CCTV to find out if he was accompanying Luna. This snippet of information does seem to throw into question the statement by former agent Brooks that there was no evidence he was with anyone else. If they thought this man was possibly with them and they haven't ruled it out, then no definitive statement about the solitary nature of Luna's journey can be given. We must also ask the very salient question that comes from a reading of the timeline, namely, who used his credit card at the King of Prussia shopping mall four hours after he died. No answers have been given. The reason there has not been any further information released to the public in answer to these questions is due to the fact that it is still an open investigation in Pennsylvania. So what do you think? Did an unprepared killer use the victim's less than reliable Swiss Army knife as an instrument of murder? Was this a case of a bizarre suicide? Or was it an attempt to garner sympathy that went wrong when an archery was ruptured? Once again, thanks to everyone for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do make sure to like, comment, share and subscribe to Mystery Scope. As always, until the next time, take care.